So we deferred asking the obvious question, this hormone that's secreted at nighttime, does that have anything to do with sleep? We deferred for about a decade because somebody pointed out that even though melatonin levels are high in humans at the time they sleep, they're also high at nighttime in rats, but rats are running around at nighttime. So I figured, well, melatonin can't be a sleep hormone, otherwise look at the rat. But then I had a very good postdoctoral fellow who said, why don't we just do the experiment and see? Charge up your axons, ready your receptors, and shift your lobes into upper beta phase. You are listening to Smart Drug Smarts, the podcast dedicated to helping you optimize your brain with the latest breakthroughs in neuroscience, nootropics, and psychopharmacology. Hello and welcome to Smart Drug Smarts. My name is Jesse Lawler. I am your host, and this is the 140th episode of this podcast dedicated to the ongoing betterment of your brain by any and all means at your disposal. This week, we're going to be talking about melatonin. Melatonin is both something that we make within our own brains and something that you can buy out in the real world. Oftentimes, it is taken as a supplement, as a sleep aid, but as we will hear, not always in the proper amounts. We're going to be talking in this episode with Dr. Dick Wortman. We talked with him back in episode number 131 about an anti-Alzheimer's food medicine medicine called Suvenade that derived from his research, but much earlier in his career, before Suvenade was even a twinkle in his eye, it was Dr. Wortman in his lab that discovered what it is that melatonin is actually doing in the human brain. So in this interview, we'll be getting into both the history and the psychopharmacology of melatonin. If you hang around until the very end of the episode, I'm going to tell you about mind reading. This is not spiritualism. We are not going to be getting woo-woo, but there is some real-life mind reading going on nowadays. Really promising findings, really sci-fi, and that'll be in the Ruthless Listener Retention gimmick. But right now, let's Kick things off first with This Week in Neuroscience. Smart Drug Smarts, This Week in Neuroscience. So imagine that you're taking a nice, quiet 3,000-mile flight you're crossing, say, from Seattle to Boston, only to discover that the pilot keeping you aloft is completely asleep. This sounds like a nightmare scenario, not something that the FAA would like to see, but in the animal kingdom, this is not necessarily such a bad thing, because it turns out that certain birds are able to fly quite admirably while asleep. So you might not be familiar with frigate birds, but frigate birds are very, very large birds. They've got wingspans of over two meters, and after after reading about this study, I think these things are just amazing. So I didn't know this. I sort of assumed that birds flew for a long time sometimes because birds can get pretty far out to sea. They can catch up drafts and don't necessarily expend a huge amount of energy while flying. But frigate birds are known to spend as much as 10 days at a time flying, which is as crazy as it sounds. They can cover as much as 3,000 miles on these flights. So they're going neck and neck with transcontinental airline flights, not in terms of speed, but in terms of distance covered. And one question that you might ask is, well, if they're flying for 10 days at a time, when the heck do they sleep? And this is something that scientists have been wondering about, speculating about for many, many years. We talked in an earlier This Week in Neuroscience, several months ago, about unihemispheric sleep in dolphins, how basically one half of a dolphin's brain can go to sleep independently of the other. The left hemisphere says, okay, right hemisphere, you're in charge for a while, I'm going to get some shut eye, and then later they switch off. This is helpful for dolphins maintaining things like breathing patterns, coming up to the surface to get some air every now and then. Now, frigate birds and other long-distance, long-time flyers like swifts, songbirds, and songpipers, they don't have this problem of suffocating while they're sleeping, they're breathing air, but they do have the very obvious problem of it sounds kind of dangerous to fly when you're asleep. And so the speculation had been that much like dolphins and other types of birds also known to engage in unihemispheric sleep, that that's what was going on in these long distance flights, that the frigate birds must be sleeping, but they were probably only sleeping with one half of their brain at a time. But this was all speculation, nobody really knew. So researchers at the Max Planck Institute for Ornithology actually rigged up a little easy EEG device, an electroencephalogram that they could put onto a bird, got a battery pack, got everything, and these birds could carry it aloft for these super long distance flights, kind of like a black box in an airplane, a flight data recorder. And then sometime later, the scientists would recapture the bird, take off the electroencephalogram data, and see what the bird was actually doing when it was flying. So they did this recently. This was just published, actually, and we now know a lot more about frigate birds. It turns out that the answer is, is basically all of the above. There is some unihemispheric sleep going on in frigate birds. This is something they do particularly frequently when they can find an updraft, someplace where the air is rising and they can use that to their advantage, not have to flap too much, but get carried higher on the breeze. What they'll do on these occasions is to basically bank into a turn one direction or another. So they'll find an updraft, they'll hook into a right turn, and the left half of their brain will stay awake. The part of their brain that's looking in the direction that they're turning will continue to stay awake, and the other half of the brain goes to sleep. They also saw instances where both halves of the brain went to sleep. These instances didn't last terribly long, just a few minutes in most cases, 
but they did seem to be fully asleep during these times. Now, birds, much like humans, have slow wave sleep as well as REM sleep, and the birds exhibited both kinds of sleep while flying. What's interesting about this is humans and most other animals, when we're in REM sleep, we basically disconnect our brain from our muscles. We lose muscle tones, so we're not actually acting out our dreams. But you can imagine how this wouldn't work so well with a bird in flight. You wouldn't want a bird to go completely limp while it's midair. But nature, the crafty beast that she is, has equipped birds to maintain muscle tone even while in REM sleep. One can only speculate that the birds must be dreaming about flying since they're continuing to fly while they're dreaming, but I don't think they know that yet. The last bit about this that's so interesting is that despite the fact that there's now this solid evidence that birds are sleeping while they're flying, the frigate birds actually sleep incredibly little. They're averaging less than an hour of sleep a day during these multi-day flights. Now, when they get back on land, they'll oftentimes sleep more than 12 hours a day. But what they don't seem to do is exhibit any of the signs of exhaustion or real debilitating sleep deprivation that we would see in animals that are used to getting a more consistent sleep cycle. So somehow their brain is making up for the fact that they're getting ridiculously little sleep during these flight periods. So one of the things that we humans hear when we're advised on our sleep is that you can't pay back a sleep debt. Apparently frigate birds have figured out a way to pay back a sleep debt, says Niels Rattenborg, one of the lead researchers on this study. Why we and many other animals suffer dramatically from sleep loss, whereas some birds are able to perform adaptively on far less sleep remains a mystery. But that is exactly what the researchers are hoping to find out next. Now that they have proof what the birds are doing, they want to know how they're doing it. So stay tuned. Smart Drug Smarts. The podcast so smart, we have smart in our title. Twice. Picked up a five-star review from Leoti S., who said, Is there a rating higher than five stars? The answer is no, but I appreciate your asking. This podcast is a wealth of information, very captivating. I love the guest speakers as they inspire me to do more research on these people and the studies discussed. Thank you, Leoti. That's definitely something I can sympathize with. Research begets research. Once you start down these rabbit holes, you want to just keep going sometimes. Speaking of research, August 9th, by the way, just a couple days from now, is Book Lover's Day. So whether or not you consider yourself a book lover, it's never too late to become one. And if you're looking for some neuroscience, science book inspiration, swing by our bookshelf page at smartdrugsmarts.com slash bookshelf. Apologies to those of you that have signed up in the past week for our newsletter and then been like, hey, where actually is the newsletter this week? I thought it came out weekly. Got a little bit behind on this one. Wound up writing something that got a lot longer than I expected it to be, but that'll probably be out by the time you hear this. For those of you who I haven't talked into signing up yet, you're cordially invited to do so. We have a sign up over at smartdrugsmarts.com slash newsletter that'll keep you posted on podcast episodes, the stuff that we've got coming up, and a weekly-ish sprinkling of what What's going on in the world of neuroscience. I just did an epically long plane flight this week. This was a transcontinental over 24 hour itinerary and I tried out something which I, I just got and I hadn't used before, but it worked so well that I wanted to mention it. Just a full blackout mask called the Mindfold. I put a picture of myself wearing this thing at Instagram.com slash smart drug smart. Every other sleep mask I've ever tried has always kind of let a little bit of light bleed in around the side. This thing, you put it on and it's full blackout. It's also super comfortable because it actually bulges off your face a little bit so you can flutter your eyelids on the inside without having your eyes touch against anything. This is an excellent addition to your napping toolkit. So yeah, I just wanted to let you know this thing exists. It is called the Mindfold. We don't have any sort of affiliation with them. I'm just throwing this out there because I think it's pretty cool. Something that we do have an affiliation with, as you know, is Axon Labs. Axon Labs is sort of the retail wing of Smart Drug Smarts. We've got a couple of stacks over there. Those stacks are called Nexus and Mitogen. You've heard me talk about them before, and you can find both of those over at axonlabs.io. So this is a melatonin episode. As you know, I actually did not use any melatonin melatonin on my transcontinental flight. I was in the lucky or unlucky position, depending on how you want to think about it, that I was pretty much exhausted when I got on the plane to begin with, so sleeping was not an issue. But I definitely did appreciate the mitogen to sort of spring to life when I got back off the plane later, get some energy flowing, get me back in the gym and up to my old tricks. I think that's all the news that we got for this week, so let's jump ahead now to the main interview. Smart Drug Smarts. So for those of you that have been following this podcast for a while, you know that we've done several Know Your Neurotransmitters episodes, and it's, it's actually been a while since we've done one, but we've not put down that series yet. We're slowly working our way through the chemicals in our brains. Now, melatonin is not a neurotransmitter, but it is what is called a neuromodulator. And for those of you keeping score at home, the definitional difference is as follows. A neurotransmitter is a messenger released from a neuron at an anatomically specialized junction. This is typically a synapse, which diffuses across a narrow cleft to affect one or sometimes two postsynaptic neurons. A muscle cell or another effector cell. So that is not what melatonin is. A neuromodulator, on the other hand, is a messenger released from a neuron in the central nervous system or in the periphery that affects a group of neurons or effector cells that have the appropriate receptors. So somewhat of a broader umbrella. And melatonin is also a hormone, as we'll hear, which I guess makes it a neurohormone. It's a name you're probably familiar with. You might see people popping melatonin pills if they're getting on transatlantic flights and they want to make sure that they can sleep on their way across the ocean. It is not to be confused with melanin, which has a very similar sounding name, but is a chemical having to do with 
with skin pigment, but we're about to be getting into all the melatonin nitty gritty with Dr. Dick Wortman, who among other honors is the Cecil H. Green Distinguished Professor at MIT and a professor of neuroscience at MIT's Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences. We first spoke with Professor Wortman just nine episodes ago, so not so long ago in episode 131, and I'd done my homework for that interview to talk with him about Suvenade, which was the subject of that interview, found out mid-interview that he was the discoverer of the effects of melatonin in the human body, which I did not know, and, and I sort of slapped my forehead at that time and <laughs> shrunk into my microphone. I was glad he couldn't see me, but immediately knew that we had to get him on again for a melatonin episode. So that subsequent conversation is what you're about to hear. So let's jump in now with Dr. Dick Wortman. Well, if you look at a textbook of medicine or physiology that was published even up into the 1960s, you look up pineal, you would see it described as a vestige, an organ that had some function in much earlier in evolutionary history, but it's lost that function with evolution. They were wrong, of course, but the reasons people tended to believe this is that, first of all, in lower animals, in, in amphibians, for instance, the pineal is, in fact, the third eye. It's a photoreceptor. Wow. And with mammals, that's really lost. So it had a function, and it lost its function. Then Another thing, in you and I, the gland itself that makes it starts to become calcified. And you can visualize that with x-rays in someone who's 8 or 10 years old. And it gets worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And usually calcification is what happens after a tissue dies. Lungs used to be full of calcium in the days of tuberculosis. So people thought that, well, pineal, uh, it's not important. It doesn't do anything. It used to. And, and it just sits there as a lump of calcium. And no function was known. And that's the way things stood, at least in the textbooks, until the 1960s. But actually, there had been some work done before the 60s that suggested where things were going to go. 1924, some studies were done at Johns Hopkins by a couple of endocrinologists, McCord and Allen. And this was kind of the heyday of finding new hormones. Yeah. And what people would do is they would set up a bioassay, something that responded if you had a biologically active compound you threw in. Then they would take a gland like the thyroid, for instance, and mash it up and put it in the medium where, the, where tadpoles were swimming. And the thyroid gland contained something, thyroxin, which when you exposed tadpoles to it, it accelerated their maturation. They became frogs faster. Okay, so once you knew that there was some biologically active compound, you could purify it, and then you could look and see what else it does. Well, at the same time, in 1924, these uh, same people, they took their tadpoles, they took pineal glands from cattle, and they mashed them up, and they threw them into the mix, the bullion base, if you will, and it turned out that the tadpoles became light, very light-colored. Now, tadpoles and amphibians treat pigment differently from you and I. We make pigment pigment in cells that are called melanocytes in the skin. And you make the pigment and then the melanocyte cells, kind of, they, they turn over. That's why you lose your suntan three or four weeks after the end of the summer. Huh. But in, um, in amphibians, the pigment is retained in cells called melanophores. And what they do, they stay there. They don't turn over. What they do is they have pigment granules inside the cell. And when the cell is stimulated by something called melanocyte stimulating hormone, the pigment granules spread out. And so the animal appears black. And then when you expose the animals, it turned out to melatonin, the pigment granules coalesced around the nucleus so the animal looked white. So in the 1920s, it was shown the pineal contained something that caused the animal to appear white because it caused the pigment granules to kind of coalesce. That was one fact, which turned out to be very important. Come back to that in a couple of minutes. Another fact had to do with the gonads. Boys especially will sometimes, rarely, develop precocious sexual maturation, precocious puberty. And it was thought that the precocious puberty was caused by a tumor of the pineal, so the pineal had something to do with the gonads. This has not held up over the years, but it was believed and it turned out to be important and that it generated some key research. And the third thing, again, it related to the third eye business. Even though the pineal of a human or a rat is no longer a third eye, people wondered whether light had something to do with the pineal anyhow. And so a woman at Wellesley College, Virginia Fisk, she kind of got to do one piece of research every seven years, they gave her time off for it. She took a bunch of rats and she put them under constant light or constant constant darkness, and she took out their pineal glands, this was already in the 1950s, and she weighed the pineals, and she discovered that light suppressed the rat, the mammalian pineal. Okay, so by the end of the 1950s, what was known, the pineal contained an active compound that did something to pigment cells, the pineal might have something to do with the gonads, and the pineal was responsive to light. So then I kind of came onto the scene. I became a medical student just around then at Harvard, and around this time, the government was trying to encourage the doctors to go into 
research, believe it or not. They send people around saying, won't you please take our money and dedicate part of your career to doing research? So there was a dean at Harvard whose job was to try to seduce medical students into spending part of their time on research. And I wanted to do that anyhow. I'd come to medical school. I wanted to work on what used to be called the mind-body problem, and that would have involved research. So anyhow, I agreed to do research, and he paired me up with a professor, a guy named Mark Altshuler. And Altshuler had a, it was, it turned out to be a totally wrong theory. And the theory was that the pineal gland had something to do with schizophrenia. And so he wanted me to set up assays for schizophrenia. Though I won't bore you with all the details, but anyhow, it introduced me to the pineal gland, and I looked into it and found that very, very little was known, but it was kind of interesting. So I started doing some research in medical school in which I took out the pineals of animals, and guess what? Their gonads matured more rapidly. Or I got some bovine pineals and ground them up and gave extracts and that made the, the gonads delayed maturation. And then I found that if you took animals and put them in light the way Dr. Fisk had done, their pineals would shrink and they would get the accelerated maturation. Giving them pineal extracts would block the effect. So anyhow, I came away from that with the notion that, hey, the pineal makes something which is probably a hormone and which probably has something to do with sexual maturation, at least in rats, and something to do with light. Okay, 1959, down in New Haven, a dermatologist, a guy named Aaron Lerner, reads the old literature and decides he would like to know what is the compound in pineal extracts that cause those tadpoles to lighten. And the reason he wanted to do this work was there's a disease called vitiligo. Perhaps you've seen people. People get deep pigmented spots. He was a dermatologist and he thought he could treat the, these people by giving them something that would cause pigment to go away everywhere so that spots wouldn't be so noticeable. So he got something like a quarter of a million pineal glands from the Armour Company, the livestock company in Chicago. Wow. And he did very good chemistry and purified a compound and found the compound that was very, very potent, making the tadpoles firm white. And he wanted to name it Yalen as he did the work at Yale, but people encouraged him not to do that. So instead he named it melatonin. So by the end of the 1950s, there's a compound in the mammalian pineal that is biologically active. Now, parenthetically, it turns out it has no real effect on pigment in people, and there still is no evidence that amphibians even actually make the compound. But we know, hey, here's a compound that does something. So people could start looking to see whether or not it did things that were interesting and important. And again, I'd meanwhile shown that it had something to do with gonadal maturation, something to do with light effects. The pineal had something to do with it. And so we could ask the question, is the active principle in the mammalian pineal that does these other things, by the way, the same compound as the compound that lightens amphibians? And I moved to the National Institutes of Health after finishing some residency training and started working with a wonderful man, man named Julius Axelrod. And Julie was fascinated fascinating in himself. He didn't get his PhD till he was 47, 48 years old. He couldn't afford to go to school, but he worked as a technician in a lab at the NIH and made great discoveries. And anyhow, by the time he was 47, 48, he'd published 100 papers, even though he didn't have a PhD. And he decided to go get a PhD. He went to George Washington University and took a couple of language tests. That was all that was needed then. Got his PhD and he started taking postdocs and I was his second postdoc. And he won the Nobel Prize about five or six years later. He was the guy that discovered uptake, which is how drugs like Prozac work, they block uptake. So when I got to work with Julie, told him what I had been doing prior to coming down, he got very interested because melatonin chemically contained a, a methyl group. And Julie had been discovering the enzymes that put methyl groups on things. And so we decided to see whether or not melatonin, besides making tadpoles light, was also a pineal hormone. And we did studies and it turned out that they were very active and we wrote the kind of the first paper on this OG 1960. 1962-1963 saying melatonin's a hormone. So then went back and tried to see whether or not the other things that had been attributed to the pineal could also be attributed to melatonin. For instance, we knew that light, exposure to light, made pineal small. Well, what did light do to melatonin production? So we did some studies and showed that, hey, if you put animals under continuous light, not only did their pineal shrink, but they pretty much stopped making melatonin. They reduced melatonin production by 80-90%. And we figured out that what's the pathway by which information goes from from the eyes to the pineal. It's no longer a photoreceptor, so you need a pathway that'll do that. So by the mid-1960s then, it was known that, well, there's this compound melatonin, which is biologically active and which uh, is controlled by light exposure and which has various biological effects. Well, then I, I moved on to MIT and set up a laboratory and the lab worked on a lot of different things. There were about 40 people in it, but one of the things always was melatonin. Let's see if we can figure out what the melatonin does. Well, we knew that 
melatonin production was suppressed in light and stimulated in darkness. Uh, what happens in people? So we set up ways of measuring blood melatonin levels in people. And in 1975, I think it was, we discovered that in people, yes, blood melatonin levels are high at nighttime and low in the daytime. And it's not that light and dark cause these changes, but rather light and dark entrain a circadian rhythm. So there's normally a circadian rhythm, as, as I said, and during the nocturnal period, melatonin production goes on actively, and during the daytime, there's very little melatonin. And we publish this, and okay, now we know that melatonin is up at nighttime. It happens at nighttime. Mm-hmm. Well, people sleep at nighttime. So I began wondering whether perhaps melatonin might have something to do with initiating sleep onset and maintaining sleep and what have you. But then I realized that, okay, you're sleeping in the middle of the night, but rats aren't. They're running around. So it can't be related to sleep, right? So I put the project aside for about 10 years. But then I had a really great postdoctoral fellow, Andy Dollins. He said, why don't we look and see what happens with melatonin and sleep anyhow, because maybe rats are different from people. So in the mid-1990s, giving very small amounts of melatonin, we found that melatonin does, in fact, promote sleep onset and also sleep maintenance. Did those studies in normal people, gave them melatonin in the middle of the day around noon, allowed them to lie down, and many of them fell asleep. So then we decided to look at a particular population that I thought might really benefit from having melatonin. Let me interrupt with a question real quick. How does melatonin interact with adenosine, another one of the brain's chemical modulators for when we get sleepy? There's no evidence that it does. I think there are redundant mechanisms that have to do with sleep. Okay. Melatonin, again, is a hormone, and it gets into the brain, and it combines with so-called melatonin receptors on brain neurons, and through this action on the receptors, it promotes sleep onset and sleep maintenance. I'm not exactly sure how adenosine works. So we had shown, and other people had also found, that as you get older, because your pineal gland is calcified, calcifying, I should say, as we discussed earlier, it puts out less and less and less melatonin at nighttime. So whereas in a normal young person, blood levels are, let's say, 10 in the daytime, there's not very little being secreted, but they rise to 150 picograms per ml at nighttime. Big daily rhythm. In an older person, like me, they're still 10 in the daytime. It's not very little is being secreted anyhow. But instead of rising to 150, they only rise to about 30 or 40. So what happens is you have enough melatonin to help you fall asleep, but not enough to keep you asleep throughout the night. Right. And the reason that lots of older people tend to awaken at 2 or 3 in the morning and lie awake in bed for half an hour or longer, unable to fall back asleep, we thought might be because they were deficient in melatonin during the night. So around the year 2000, we started doing some studies on older people who complained about this kind of insomnia and who, in fact, we could show had low blood melatonin levels during the night. And we found that, yes, if we gave them supplemental melatonin before they went to sleep or before they awaken, I suppose, we could help them to sleep through the night. There's something called the sleep efficiency. Sleep efficiency really is what percent of the time that you're lying there are you actually asleep. Right. And in normal younger people, it's like 92, 93%. Everybody awakens, but you're not even aware of it. You may awaken and go pee or something and then go back to sleep. But older people, the sleep efficiency may only be like 60 or 70% during the middle of the night. And that's not that's really not very pleasant. So we did studies and we found that, yeah, giving melatonin to these people would very much promote the maintenance of sleep throughout the night. But the dose that you had to give was very, very low. You only wanted to give enough to get them back up from 10 to 150. But people started taking immense doses of melatonin, partly, I guess, because in America, we always think bigger is better. They would take doses, let's say, of three milligrams or five milligrams, which are like 10 to 15 times more than they should take. And if they took it just for one night while they were flying to Europe or something, that would be okay because you can't do too much damage. But if they try to take it every night, the way older people really need to do, what happens is the ability of the melatonin to stimulate its receptors in the brain diminished. It, the receptors became less sensitive to melatonin. Right. So you have people who say, oh, a doctor, it was great. I responded beautifully for a week or so, and then it stopped working. Well, that's why it stops working. You desensitize the receptors. The problem is you want to give enough melatonin to people if they're taking it at bedtime so that levels are still high in the middle of the night. But the turnover time is pretty fast. So if you give people 0.3 at bedtime, then the odds are that by 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock in the morning, there really isn't going to be very much left in the circulation. So why not give them 10 times as much when they go to sleep so that you'll have it when you need it? 
in the middle of the night. Well, then your levels get to be far too high, and that's what causes the desensitization, etc. So what companies have been doing is playing around with long-acting preparations, and one that really intrigues me, it's a capsule, okay? And there's a capsule within a capsule inside it. So inside the outer capsule, there's a solution that contains a starter dose, 0.3 of melatonin, and then the inner capsule contains another dose of melatonin, 0.6, so that you take the outer capsule and you get the solution right away, but then over a period of time, you break down the inner capsule and get basically the second dose in, in the middle of the night. And apparently it's highly effective. But I think that this sort of thing, a preparation that presents it so that blood levels are high enough when you need it, but not terribly high when you don't need it, I think that really will be a big advance. Yeah, I'm kind of surprised they haven't been doing that already because it seems like, I think it's called buffering pills that have that time release mechanism as, as a fairly solved problem. Well, here's the thing. If you go into a health food store, you'll find a bunch of things on the shelf that claim they have a, a delayed action component which releases it. But then you look and you ask, well, have they ever actually done a study right. to give these pills to people and take some blood and measure the melatonin and then they glare at you and they walk away. <laughs> but you can claim anything you want. In any case, we've not only found that yeah, melatonin would help people to stay asleep, but also we found that perhaps paradoxically, the lower the dose, the better. And the dose that people should take is one milligram or less. Most older people do well with 0.3 milligrams if they can find it for sale at a store or else they buy one milligram pills and kind of cut them in half. Anyhow, we published this in 2001 and then unfortunately for a lot of reasons, it appeared on 9-13-2001. Oh, jeez. But what happened two days earlier in 9-11, okay? So MIT had prepared major press releases about this to go everywhere because really thought it was important. <laughs> no newspaper was interested in publishing anything about melatonin and sleep two days after 9-11. And for that reason, it took a long time for it kind of to catch on. The other thing that happened, when MIT decided to go ahead and patent the discovery, I don't have any patents, but MIT has a bunch of patents and things that I've discovered. And okay, that's the condition of employment. They decided to go ahead and patent it, but they made a mistake. Instead of patenting any dose of melatonin, they figured that, no, let's just patent it up to one milligram because the FDA is going to regulate this. After all, we're using it as a drug, right? Right. And if the FDA right. regulates it, they're not going to let companies sell 10, 15, 20 times more than what's needed. Good idea, but the FDA decided not to regulate it. They decided to call this hormone a dietary supplement. <laughs> dietary supplements are not regulated by the FDA, so it was a way of getting it out of their hair. Yeah. The thing is, yeah. it's not a dietary supplement. No food has ever been shown to raise blood melatonin levels. There are a lot of compounds in foods like serotonin, which have some chemical properties similar to melatonin, but if you do the kind of rigorous testing you have to do, and no one has ever demonstrated melatonin in food, and no one has ever demonstrated any food raises blood levels of melatonin. So calling it a dietary supplement is just plain wrong. Well, what this meant, though, was that if companies sold more than one milligram of melatonin, they didn't have to pay MIT its royalty of, what, of a hundredth of a penny per pill, wow. something of that sort. So that's the reason. If you go into a dietary supplement store right now, you'll see loads of bottles of 10 milligram pills and 5 milligram pills and 3 milligram pills. You'll see some of 1 milligram, but rarely will you see the correct dose, which is 0 0.3 milligram. Unbelievable. So the companies, I mean, they really ought to, you know, to give people what the, the correct dose is, but I guess they have their own business reasons for not doing so. If someone is just taking melatonin because they have a trip coming up and they need some assistance in falling asleep on the jet for one night or two nights, it doesn't really matter much what dose they take. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if they're going to need it continuously or continually or whatever the word, then they really should take the lowest fully effective dose because anything more than that is going to desensitize the brain and make them less and less responsive to melatonin. So that's kind of where things are right now. Loads of people take it. I received some information from the branch of the NIH that deals with dietary supplements. One and a half to two million people in America presumably bought and used melatonin last February. That was a month that they kind of assessed this. And people are using it. And the main use for it, again, is not in people who are going to Europe. It's in older people who can't make enough and who need it to kind of stay asleep. And I'm really delighted that so many people are using this thing that I kind of found because you cannot commit suicide with melatonin. <laughs> Utterly non-toxic. And that's another reason, I think, why the FDA was willing not to label it a drug or even right. label it a hormone. They just wanted to get it out of their hair. They were dealing with this at the same time they were deciding to try to get nicotine less available. And I guess they figured they had enough fish to fry at that time. Yeah. How does melatonin sort of clear the system when the sun is up and 
when we don't need it at the higher levels within our body. Is it something that is actively cleaned out of the blood? Yes, in the liver. Melatonin, chemically, is very lipid-soluble. Melatonin is simply serotonin, in which the two ends of serotonin that are electrically charged, they're blocked. As a consequence, melatonin is very, very soluble in lipids. It's also soluble in water, but more so in lipids. So it's secreted into the circulation, and of course the brain is lipid, and it goes everywhere, but it really concentrates in the brain, which is where it's supposed to work. But then, when it goes through the liver, it's further changed enzymatically to water-soluble metabolites, which are excreted in the urine. So if you stop secreting it for a couple of hours, its levels fall pretty rapidly. That's why the blood melatonin levels really look just like a square wave. It's low, then wham, it gets to be high around 10, 11 at night, stays up till 5 or 6 in the morning, and wham, comes back down again till the next night. As far as how the body knows when it's light and dark, is there any particular wavelength of light? Is this light coming in through the eyes? Does the skin have anything to do with it? Some of those questions, I guess, would be interesting to talk about. Sure. The way the body knows for melatonin really is through the eye. Every now and then you'll hear a paper, and it was a paper a couple of years ago, I'm sort of laughing about it, in which someone said he would shine light in the back of the knee that <laughs> controls melatonin. Let us just say that has not been confirmed, okay? But it got a lot of publicity because I think reporters want to get a lot of publicity, right? No, it comes in via the eye, and the information about light goes to the brain, but the portion of that information that will control hormone secretion, melatonin, goes to a different part of the brain, then eventually it goes to this pathway that I discovered in animals, down the spinal cord and out sympathetic nerves. And sympathetic nerves usually run to blood vessels, but in this case, sympathetic nerves run right back up into the head and communicate with the pineal cells and control the production of melatonin. So in dark you have more sympathetic nervous firing in the nerves that go to the pineal, and so it makes more melatonin. And in light, the sympathetic nerves paradoxically stop firing and you stop making the melatonin. Right. Now, in terms of wavelength, I think I published on this a long time ago, and virtually any visible wavelength will suppress melatonin production. The most potent visible wavelength is yellow-green. That's the strongest suppressor, but they all will do it. Now, some people believe that they benefit by spending the early evening, I suppose, in blue light. I find it awfully hard to read by blue light. The blue light is only minimally suppresses melatonin production, but there too it depends on the intensity of the light. If you provide enough light to have some practical benefit, like being able to read, then it really doesn't make much difference whether the light is blue or even red or green or what have you. There was a lot of interest 30, 40 years ago in using light per se as a treatment for diseases. And this came about because actually the Russians showed this. If you had newborn kids that had jaundice, as a lot of kids do, and you took their bed out of the nursery and put it under the direct sunlight, then you cured the jaundice. And there it was shown that, in fact, it was the blue light and sunlight that got rid of the bilirubin in the blood. And so companies began manufacturing blue light emitting devices for the treatment of kids, particularly premature kids, with a lot of jaundice. And they work beautifully. But that really does work via the skin, not via the pineal gland. It seems like there's been a lot of buzz in the past couple of years about different wavelengths of light and how this has different effects on us, waking us up in the morning or keeping us awake too late at night, that the wavelength itself can be a big circadian trend. Trigger. It sounds like, from what you're saying, that's a little bit overblown. I think that's true. I think what's more important is the intensity of the light. Yeah. If instead of going sharp on, sharp off, if you modulate it, you go from no lights gradually over a period of some minutes up to full light and then back down again, I think that probably is effective, at least for some people. And what about people who are fully blind and aren't getting any information at all through their eyes? Do they exist in a constant melatonin state naturally? Well, they're all over the map. Some blind people will continue to have a, a circadian rhythm that's pretty close to 12 hours. Some of them will have a circadian rhythm that can be 10 or even 14 hours. And some of them will have irregularity from day to day in what their rhythms are. The question is, how do these people respond to the lighting environment if they don't perceive light? The answer is they're not really responding to the lighting environment. They're responding to other behaviors that are coupled to the lighting environment. I mean, if you live in a world in which at a certain period of the 24-hour cycle, people are talking to you, there's noise, people are working, etc., etc., that's called daytime, right? Right. And you hope. Other parts of the day. Yeah, you hope. That's right. So people can get some control over circadian rhythms by using other cyclic environmental cues above and beyond light. Eating, for instance. Eating can be a major cue controlling metabolic function of the body. If you eat a food that contains a fair amount of protein, this turns on production of a lot of proteins like albumin, for instance, in, in the liver. And it also it turns on serotonin production in the brain if you're eating mostly carbohydrates. So you can respond to those cues which are spread out through the 24-hour cycle and get some benefit that way. However, it's not as good as having sight.
Just speaking of food, actually, there's a relationship, as I understand it, between melatonin and insulin production, and this might sort of inform when we might want to time our meals with our sleeping. Can you talk about that a little? This is something that has been written about by a couple of people. It's by no means kind of ready to go into the standard melatonin literature. Here's what I mean by that. There's a internet textbook called Up to Date that very large numbers of doctors subscribe to, and I write the section on melatonin in that. And so every year I have to ask myself, well, is the evidence solid enough so I can canonize it, you know, by putting right. it in. I have not yet put melatonin and insulin in yet. I'm following it. It would be very interesting if there is a real relationship. All I can say is I will continue to follow it. I don't think at this point enough is known to warrant changes in lifestyle to deal with it. You mentioned in an email that I might come across information on melatonin as an antioxidant. That was a spurious claim, something to watch out for. Do you want to officially debunk that one? Yeah. If you give melatonin to raise blood levels to one to 10,000 times higher than they normally are, that has some antioxidant activity. And that's what's been shown. People have measured antioxidant activity in the test tube. They've put in concentrations of melatonin that are utterly unrealistic. And concentrations at which if you put in a hundredth as much vitamin C, you'll get an equivalent amount of antioxidant activity or vitamin E, for <laughs> right. instance. I suspect, now this sounds, sounds conspiratorial, that the people who are selling these mega doses of 10 milligrams of melatonin, maybe they know in their heart of hearts they shouldn't be doing it for sleep, but maybe they say, well, it'll be good for your oxidation capacity. I don't know. It's way off the charts in terms of the concentrations that are needed. The pineal body, other than producing melatonin and slowly calcifying, is there anything else that it seems to be doing? Any other functions? Every now and then somebody will write a paper claiming that he has found some peptide in the pineal, but then they don't get confirmed. And so they kind of fall by the wayside. I'm afraid I would have to say no to your question right now yeah. with the disclaimer that it wouldn't utterly shock me if next month an article appears that's a good article claiming that something else has been found. You know, the last word has not been spoken on these things. And it's important if you're interested to follow. But no, I'm afraid at this point, there's nothing else that I know of that one can claim the pineal does, but biologic importance besides make melatonin. Stay tuned. Smart Drug Smarts. So thank you so very, very much to Dr. Wortman for taking the time for that conversation. I thought that was super interesting. We got kind of a, a great cross-section of scientific history and the do's and don'ts of how people actually can and should use melatonin. Cautionary tales on how to go about patenting a drug if you're a university. A little bit of corporate intrigue, even a small-scale conspiracy theory. So main takeaway, small amounts of melatonin are all you need, probably. Do not think that because the pills come in a certain size, that is necessarily the size that you need to be taking. But that is it for this Know Your Neuromodulators coverage of melatonin, let's move on to the Ruthless Listener Retention Gimmick. Smart Drug Smarts, Ruthless Listener Retention Gimmick. Scientists at UC Berkeley are working on a device literally meant to read people's minds. And to a certain extent, they've already got a version of this working. This is a team led by Professor Robert T. Knight. And what they've succeeded in doing so far is being able to read and process the incoming audio signals arriving in a person's brain. So a person hears something, they process these sounds into speech, and the electrode within the brain, that this is an implanted device, are able to pick up the brain signals as the brain recognizes those words and then reconstruct those words as an audio file. So this would be a little like having a a microphone inside of a person's skull rather than inside of a room where the person was. It's like if you imagine a spy novel where somebody is bugged, this would literally be putting the bug not in the room where they are, not like fixing it to their clothing, but putting the bug inside their head so it can hear what they're hearing, which actually in some ways could be better because one of the things that the human brain does is it parses out the sounds of speech from all the other noises going on. You could have a conversation in a room with a heavy fan blowing or a washing machine making clothes tumbling noises and stuff like that and still carry on a conversation with no problem, but a microphone in that room is going to pick up all those noises without distinguishing the important parts, the speech versus all the background noise. So one kind of cool upside about this reading directly from the brain is that the brain's already doing that processing and parsing out the speech from the background noise for you. But that was just step one of the process because their end game here is not to just reconstruct what people are hearing, but to actually be able to read the thoughts that people are thinking when people are constructing sentences in their head as to what they want to say. There are a lot of different neurological disorders where somebody might not be able to physically make speech, but they're able to perfectly compose sentences in their head. They know what they'd like to say, they just can't physically say it. Paralysis is one obvious example. Lou Gehrig's disease can be another, says Professor Knight. We want to develop an implantable device that decodes the signals that occur in the brain when we think about a word, then turns these signals into a sound file that can be reproduced on a speech device. The way that this works at the moment physically is that a small hole is drilled into the skull, and then an electrode implanted, which if you can imagine kind of like a pinwheel or one of those Asian fans that fans out but can also be collapsed down into just, you know, what looks like a single line, they poke this electrode in 
plane when it's collapsed. And then they spin it in a circle so that all these different electrodes deploy. And they're putting that over parts of the brain that are involved in the construction and imagination of speech. Just like pretty much anything else that we do in the physical world, we're able to imagine speech and activate the same areas of the brain as we would if we were actually speaking. And despite the many, many variables as we're putting together sounds in our head to construct speech, things like the pace of speech, the tone of voice, emphasis on certain words. So this is not an easy task that the Berkeley scientists have set for themselves, but they have already been able to differentiate between certain words. And the goal here is a full prosthetic thought to speech device that despite the difficulties, they don't really have any problem in principle thinking that they'll be able to eventually create. We like to think of ourselves as a digital speakeasy for brain hackers, but you can call us smart drug smarts. Okay, you heard it. That is the entire episode number 140 now coming in for a landing. Thank you for hanging around until the end. If you enjoyed this episode, please tell a couple of friends about Smart Drug Smarts. Pass us around on social media. Retweet us, like us, do us, whatever kind of online favors you want to. Always much appreciated. Everything that we talked about here will be online at smartdrugsmarts.com slash 140. Last week in episode number 139, we had our blueberry episode. I went a little bit off the blueberry deep end, but thank you for indulging me. Next week, we've got a couple of options. I haven't decided what it's going to be yet. we got an interesting interesting kind of double interview episode on hypnosis that will be happening sometime soon, a follow-up episode on nicotine, and then a really epic length interview on ketosis and the brain that is such a beast I might actually break that up into two episodes. haven't decided on that yet, but anyway, there will be something good back here for you next Friday. Same time, same podcast, and with that same unflagging commitment to helping you fine-tune the performance of your own brain. Have a great week in the meantime, and stay smart. You've been listening to the Smart Drug Smarts podcast. Visit us online at www.smartdrugsmarts.com and subscribe to our mailing list to keep your neurons buzzing with the latest in brain optimization. Smart Drug Smarts should be listened to for entertainment purposes only. Although some guests on the show are medical doctors, most are not. And the host is just some random guy. Nothing you hear on this podcast or read at smartdrugsmarts.com should be considered medical advice. Consult your doctor and use some damn common sense before doing anything you think might have a lasting impact on your brain.